even if they're not elected, but they're appointed by the elected officials, should look like us, should look like the community. So that could be another call to action. So moving right along, um, let's talk about unity and mergers. Um, I spoke about the, the Puerto Rican diaspora group, which is just me, but you know, I can bring some others. Um, I told, I told um, Linwood that I have my check, so I'm joining the NAACP, so you have one more member as of today. And I'm going to make sure that we, well, I have to fill it out still, but yeah. <laughs> fill it out. Yeah, we'll take a picture. And then I would encourage members of my Hispanic community and others in general, period, because really we look at all the different and bring them to the table. This is an organized group. Let's get stronger. Though on a national level, the NAACP has moved mountains with the issues that you have championed. So let's come together and champion these issues, not just for, for, the, for the African Americans, but for the Latinos and all, because at the end of the day, historically, if we were learning our history, we would know that we have more in common and that I'm just as much black and African American as the next person. Because, let me just a little bit of history here, and this is where I think that there's a huge problem. We teach, we teach white American history instead of the history of the United uh -huh. States. You are right. We don't, you know, if it wasn't for Black History Month, little children would know of all the accomplishments that African Americans have made. Even adults don't know. They don't know about the traffic lights. They don't know about the underground city in D.C. You know, we know about Ben Carson because Ben Carson. So thinking this man, you know, this heart surgery, think of look at him. But that's okay. He did it and he's part of our history. You know, we need to teach the children their history and we ourselves need to learn the history so that we can teach it. Puerto Rico is a perfect example. I just could not believe that 51% of people that were polled didn't know that Puerto Rico was part of the United States. And when I look at my own people, you know, Puerto Ricans, and how some of them, you know, they identify with, I'm shocked that more of them would rather, uh, let me just quote you what a woman said to me, and this is when I was working with Mayor Sills, and she worked for a newspaper back then, and she said, well, I told my daughter, she is not allowed to date a black man. She can go out with a white man because we have to better the race. And she said that to me, and I'm like, am I hearing this correctly? So when you have that happening in homes, across the nation, when you have that division, and believe me, it's by design, to turn us against each other, mm -hmm. that is terrible. Because if you know anything about the history of Puerto Rico, you would know that the people who lived there were the Arawak Indians, not the yes. name Taino that they gave us, the Arawak Indians. And that when the Spanish came with the African slaves, that everybody co-mingled, and when you go to Puerto Rico, any of the coastal towns, that is where you will find the black Puerto Ricans with the coarse hair, because that is where they took the slaves to do what? To work the sugar cane. And it's all found in the coastal areas. If you go to the town of Loisa, they celebrate their African heritage. They come out with the drumming, with the colors. You know, you think you were in Africa when you were that festival. But see, when you don't teach that history, especially when you have the Puerto Ricans here on the mainland that maybe haven't gone, that haven't visited, they don't know. They don't know. And when they make us check a box and choose between being black and white instead of being able to say, I'm Hispanic and this is an ethnicity, not a race, you know, at the end of the day, there's only one race, one pure race, and that's the human race. So why don't we focus on that instead? So I am defiant. I will not check the box. But if I was gonna check the box, I would choose black before I would choose white, because I identify with my African culture. And, and I may be one of the few, but I do. And I, maybe that's why my black people love me, because they know I love them too. So we gotta teach and we gotta educate, because that is how you break down these things that keep us apart. And the fight that we really should be fighting should be this fight of classism versus the racism. See, as long as you can keep people here on the ground level fighting about those issues, they're never going to challenge the real issue, and that is the equitable access to wealth. As long as we can keep communities poor, mm -hmm. incarcerated, you know, hooked on drugs, we don't move up. We stay there. We don't, we're not a threat. But when we start getting educated and moving up 
the chains, and then we become a threat. Right. When you elect a black man to president, then, wow, we really became a threat. <laughs> but you know, everything that's going on now politically, I, as much as I feel the way that I do, you know, we gotta look at the positive. The divisiveness, the underlying hate that people have towards each other, even though they pretend they don't, it was always there. It never went away. It was always there. That's why I say that in the 52 years of the Civil Rights Act, we've come far, but not far enough. So let's be thankful that it's, that it's been brought out to the surface. Because you know what happens when it gets brought out to the surface? It's going to get dealt with. And now we can deal with it. Now we can have the uncomfortable conversations about race, religion, and culture. Well, let's talk about it. Because when we don't talk about it and we're not taking action, it continues to perpetuate, you know, generation after generation. The one lesson we can learn about the women coming forward about the sexual assault is that it took one, the power of one brave woman to stand up. And boy, it really bothered me when people say, how come they didn't stand up further? Because unless you've been there and you know what it feels like and why you won't speak up, because you don't feel like you have the power because the person who did this to you had more power than you. And you didn't press charges and you didn't fight because it would be looked at frivolous and, and it's their word against your word and who do you believe? We see this unfolding before our very eyes right now. So the power of one woman bringing it forward, look at all the other women, every day, somebody new, another person. So what I hope this does, and please don't say, oh, this is getting old, please, because this is too important of an issue just like our issues are very important. Now it has come to the surface. Now it will be dealt with. Now it's not that dirty little secret that you sweep under the rug. Now more women can maybe escalate up that ladder of success without the fear of knowing that they have to sleep with their boss to get there, without being sexually assaulted. You know, maybe now we would look at women as equitable members of society because we can get the job done and we can get it done efficiently. And if there was more of us in leadership and more people of color and women of color in leadership, things would look very different in America. So the things we care about are the things that we actually have problems and issues with right now. The education, the criminal justice, you know, the environmental issues. So that is, you know, what I'm saying to you. We got to unite. We got to bring these things to the service. Be enraged, but take action with that rage. Now, the one thing, the call to action, what I would propose, and you have your committees, maybe we need to have a call to action group break away and look at what issues we're going to champion. We are already working on these issues, so we're not gonna do duplicity, but let's look at what we can do. This is the one item, what are we gonna do? And I would like to suggest a few that are near and dear to my heart that I see are very problematic, and some of them have been spoken about in this conference. One, you do have the register to vote group, so let's keep doing that. Let's expand that. Let's get more people to mob. Let's work with the Latinos and get them. Because I'll tell you what, in Puerto Rico, people are very political, so it's very shocking to me that they come here and they don't engage and they don't vote. I've met people on the campaign trail that told me they lived here 30 years, they're U.S. citizens, and they never voted or registered to vote. And that, to me, is shocking and unacceptable. So that has to change. Um, Let's identify people here locally to run for office. Win, lose, or draw, it doesn't matter, just do it. But then don't leave them out there high and dry either because that's how I felt I was left during my campaign. You know, stand behind them, come together, help them, raise the money. People culturally, I don't think my people understood that it took money to run a campaign. So the money wasn't there. I mean, thank God for the people who did donate. I was one of my supporters. Um, but we need to help them. Don't leave them there. Help raise money for them. And let's get some folks out there. Is it time? Hello. Hello. Are you doing the little thing? Oh, no. I'm almost up. done. Advocacy. We need to be out there advocating, but not just advocating, taking action on these things. So criminal justice reform, that has been discussed. It's deplorable what is happening, this mass incarceration of young men and people of color. And the women are getting thrown in there. We don't talk about the women, but that, those jails are starting to get pretty full. Um, you know, we have to look at the prison system and the way it's set up. You know, what happened in our prison was awful. Lives were lost. More lives would be lost. So, but it was set up to do that because the concerns of the prisoners were never heard. 
And this whole report that was done by the governor, thank you, Mr. Governor, and thank you for doing that report. But all you're talking about is the correctional officers, which, yes, I agree. They were underrepresented. They didn't have the help that they needed. And maybe they may not even have the, the sensitivity training that they need to be able to be good prison guards. But whatever happened, happened because there was a group of people that were so enraged and they were so tired of being treated less than humans in there by some of those prison guards that they rebelled. And look at where we are now, one big mess. But let's not have one conversation without having the other. Because I know people on the inside and they tell me what goes on and it's not pretty. And we can't sit out here and allow this to happen to another human being, regardless of whatever mistake they made. Education Commission that was put together came out with this excellent report about what to do with the issue of education in Delaware. But now, oh, we don't have the funding for it, or we can't do this, we can't do that. How do we just take something that was put together by leaders and members of our community and toss it to the side and still not address this issue of education that is holding back our young people, our young students of color that can't seem to progress because if they, you know, if they make a mistake or if there's an infraction that they've committed, they're being tossed out of the school while their counterpart, who might be of a different color or culture, is being left in the school. Where, where's the fairness? Where's the equality? And then you wonder why people are angry. So that can't continue to happen. Why do we have 19 freaking school districts? How does a little state, a drop of a bucket, a drop of a bucket in a state like Delaware have 19 school districts? Is this just how we take care of our friends with their six digit salaries, at least 150 a year? And then they have assistants and deputies and the staffing in the office. If you look at all the money that we would save with just three to five school districts and put that money and invest in education, real education for all of our children, have the resources for those children in Wilmington and across our state that are witnessing people getting shot before their very eyes and their neighborhoods. These children are traumatized and they're not getting the help they need because their parents, unfortunately, don't even know that there's services they can take advantage of or they just don't do it because they've accepted this is a way of life and it is not a way of life. These are babies. And when they see this and they grow up in this atmosphere, they go out there and perpetuate what they see. So we gotta stop that. And one of my theories that I came up with and I talked about this during my campaign was is, you know, when we look at who makes up the city, as an example, I have a lot of single moms raising children alone. They are living in, in very, you know, dire situations. Sometimes they don't have the food stamps, they're not enough to get food on the table at the end of the day. And I'll tell you right now, as a mother, there's nothing more frustrating than when you can't feed your children Many of them are victims of abuse. They self-medicate. Now they themselves become, you know, addicts. They're not adequately taking care of their children. And I look at all the different reasons why us women have things that have happened to us and we're broken and we need to heal. But if you're not healing, and if we don't focus on healing the mothers, then they're raising broken children. Broken moms are raising broken children. And these children are going into society and creating what we have going on now. These children were born innocent, and I'm telling you, you can, anyone, and I'm sure you've had this experience, and the police officers have told me this, and others, when we speak to children, not one child has ever said to them that they wanna be uh, uh, you know, a gang member, that they wanna be a drug dealer. No, they wanna be police, they wanna be firemen, teachers, lawyers, doctors, some of them even wanna be presidents, because now they believe that they too can be a president, because they saw that example. That's why our community leaders need to look like the community, so those children have something to aspire to. So, you know, I would like to see that be something that we do, that we find a way of working with the church. It's not social services, but yes, letting them know that there's resources, but gaining their trust. Women who have been victims to help other victims, survivors, that survivors can help the women, because I think that that truly would change things in our community. So I'm gonna wrap it up now. I think I got all my points across. We've gotta learn, teach, and share the history, right? So that we realize that we're more alike than different. We're going to elect leaders that look like us in the community. We're gonna merge and work with other groups. We're gonna get an NAACP app so that we can communicate, maybe have some breakout sessions and have a group that you know, chooses what is gonna be our maybe three. Three things that we're gonna work on for 2018. We know